for game. Obviously, you've had quite a few voices in the book. Yeah. Um, where did you get them all from? Well, it was it was really a long, long list of people that we were we thought would be perfect, and we sort of worked through it. And there were people who were just not available. Uh, Stephen Fry, we would love to be a voice of the book, and he wants to do it. But every time we tour, he's somewhere else, and this year he's in America doing Shakespeare. Um, we had uh, oh, lots of others, you know, lots of all the names that people think of as being perfect voice of the books. We pretty much asked them all to do it, um, but gradually uh, people come through who can't do it, who are available and really keen. And we've had a fantastic uh, run. We've had uh, we started with Neil Gaiman, who's brilliant, who's the fantastic writer and uh, and uh, and uh, author. Uh, we've had John Culshaw, who's the impressionist who did the tour last year and does lots of. Um, stuff he does it in the character of Peter Jones and so on. And then we've had Anita Dobson was our first lady voice of the book. She was brilliant. She really joined in. When everybody put the Jujanta sunglasses on, she put a pair of sunglasses on. She was really, and she was dancing around in the chair to the band. Um, Phil Jupiter has been back. <coughs> Excuse me, John Chalice has been back. Um, uh, we've had Danny John Jaws, the cat from Red Dwarf. He was on doing our voice of the book in Manchester last night. And tonight we've got Shappy Corsandi, the uh, comedian uh, she's doing tonight and a couple of others. And we've had Harriet Walter, who's a proper Shakespearean actress. Um, Miriam Margulies, who's just fantastic and very funny. So we've had a whole range of different people from comedians to serious actresses to... Uh, to, to impressionists and it's wonderful because everybody brings their own thing to the book how long did it take you to actually get from like you know with um, all the noises and everything yes and yeah. that um, basically how long did it take to actually become to, 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 do, to do sound effects and everything to, as a career sort yeah. of thing well I started, I got a job at the BBC, which was really lucky. In those days, that was the only real way to get into sound. And um, we, we were trained to do what they call spot effects, which is really all the noises you hear in a radio drama of, you know, putting something up, putting it down, pouring a cup of tea, opening a door, opening a drawer. That's quite a good drawer sound effect, actually. Um, we, would, we had all these, uh, we, we had this sort of training for doing dramas and so on. Um, but we could choose to be one of many things. We, there were various jobs we could choose to do, and there were there were certain uh, people who just wanted to operate the panel and turn the switches and the knobs. Other people were happy to play in tapes and edit, and other people liked to rattle teacups. And my problem was I liked to do all three. So eventually I had to sort of... I worked in telly for a bit, but I ended up working in radio again and doing drama and, and playing with sound effects till uh, on a level where they were just layer on layer on layer of sound effects. How difficult, because I know you've had five books to try and condense into one show, has it been um, to, you know, what scenes to pick? And what Very hard. Now? It's been really hard picking what to put in because uh, there's so much good stuff that Douglas wrote. But I think the thing was it had to be material that, first of all, people knew because the Hitchhiker fans do want to sort of hear the scenes that they know and love. And the second thing was that are actually funny and a sort of laugh out loud way because we're in an audience situation. And then having decided, for example, tonight we've added, uh, in this year's show, we've added the total perspective vortex, which is when Zaphod is put into this sort of torture machine that shows him, him in relation to everything, uh, you know, as a tiny microscopic dot, which of course isn't Zaphod's idea of himself at all. Um, then we had to figure out, well, how are we going to do that um, and can we use one of our existing props in a different way to create this thing? And, and so you'll find we've rather cleverly turned our Neutromatic tea machine around and it suddenly becomes the total perspective vortex. James, you had a question in, to do with Safe Rod? You had a question in, to do with Safe Rod? What was it about heads? Um, about there being a different Safe Rod this time around? Oh, right. Yes. James? Yes, we've got a different. We got a different. Do you want to know about the new Safe Rod we've got? He's really good. He's really good, actually. Um, I have to say Mitch has been fantastic and I think it's because uh, Mitch says he's placed his whole life on being Zaphod and Zaphod's a bit of an idiot and so uh, he's uh, Mitch kind of brings an energy to it which really has been a lot of fun and very funny and I have to say Mitch single-handedly although we have um, Sam uh, who plays random stands behind Mitch and operates the second head occasionally Sam's busy getting ready to play another part so Mitch is operating the second head and playing with his own head as the first head, and he's been superb. So it's been a real pleasure. 
And um, what's it like actually seeing kids say James's age come to see, to see the show? It's what we're doing it for. It's why we're doing it because we because you know I mean as you see, James is is is, is James is looking for a bit of entertainment even as we speak, <laughs> yeah. and, and, James. and what really pleases me is that when kids in the, in the studio are actually being entertained by the show, which when you think about it, people standing at microphones holding scripts doesn't sound like it's entertaining, but the thing is that it begins to capture the imagination, and then of course Marvin comes on and it really begins to work really well. How comes he never, the actor who plays Marvin never comes on tour? Well, he, he couldn't last year, he was in Oliver. My problem was I didn't know what to do. Uh, because I lost the actor and he rang me just as I was going on my summer holiday saying I'm really sorry but I can't do the tour so I was in a real spot and about 10 minutes later I, I stopped the car and rang him back and I said well hang on a minute if we pre-record the voice this is a robot we're talking about Shall, if we build a, a puppet robot let's do it that way and, he's, and he was really pleased so he recorded the voice so we've done it but I think I think now he's a bit cross because actually the puppets worked so well <laughs> 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 The only person that I like in that, that studio is the robot. You like, really? Oh, well, well I'm, I'm hoping you might like one or two a bit more after you've seen the because show, James. he's an absolute idiot. He's an absolute idiot, the robot. Well, he's very <laughs> depressed. Um, <laughs> earlier you spoke about Neil Gaiman. Obviously, yeah. I know you were very busy earlier on this year with Metalware. Yes, um, that's right. How did that come about? Uh, we, uh, I've been trying to sell, a, sell the uh, BBC a, a, a production of uh, Neil Gaiman for, for 15 odd years. And finally, uh, one of my uh, friends, Heather Lama, BBC drama in Northern Ireland, um, persuaded them to take a Neil thing. And uh, Neil and Heather very kindly asked me to adapt and co-direct it. Um, and then we got this amazing cast of Benedict Cumberbatch, yeah. Christopher yes. Lee, James McAvoy. Oh, it won't be a minute, James. And it was just a fantastic cast um, doing this amazing piece. Um, it's and like a it Hollywood was, film cast. Yeah, it isn't was it? James. I can't believe it. I mean, it was just a dream come true. And and the beauty of it was they were all so enthused. They were all so really up for it. So it was super. Really worked well. If you could have a dream person as voice of the book, who would it be? Ah, do you know I've got loads I mean I'd love to get Stephen Fry to do it because you know he was in the radio series one of the radio series I did I'd love to get but I'd quite like to get someone like William Shatner to do it that would be fun and and that's then, a star and then Nimoy Nimoy absolutely yeah. one of the one of the greats of star you know popular science fiction would be super but I, I really I don't mind it, it it's amazing there are giving a good read is hard to do getting a good reader and and someone who can get the sense across i'm just happy when we we have people who want to do it as shabby and and so on have done yeah. so what's next after hitchhikers uh well there's going to be some more bbc radio stuff that i can't talk about but should be of interest and then uh we have uh I'm working on some picture work uh, with um, Andy Seacombe and Dave Gibbons, the Watchman artist. So, you know, got a, got, got a range of different things happening. Um, as always, you know, one can't talk too much about one, never tell God one's plans, you know. But there's, they're, they're, I think, you know, with any luck, I'll still be paying the mortgage this time next year. <laughs>